It's Elimination Saturday in the SEC with multiple games on the docket this weekend that could knock SEC teams out of contention for the college football playoff. Welcome into SEC Football Unfiltered, our podcast from the USA Today Network. I'm Blake Topmeyer alongside John Adams. A couple huge games inside the SEC this weekend. Alabama at LSU in what is a de facto elimination game for the loser. The winner of that game will enjoy a, a clean, pretty clean path to the playoff as long as they keep winning, while the loser would have three losses and, and is all but certain to be on the outside looking in of the playoff. And then Georgia plays at Ole Miss in what would be an elimination game for Ole Miss if they lose. We'll get into those games on the pod today, of course, make our Week 11 picks as well. Uh, But first, let's start with an overview of the playoff picture. And in full disclosure, we are recording this episode on Tuesday afternoon. By the time you are listening to this, you you will have learned the first college football playoff rankings. Uh, We could take a guess as we record this as to what they will be, but we don't need to do that because you've already seen what those rankings are. But in terms of sweeping overview, John, We've been talking for weeks about how four playoff qualifiers seems like the number, the most realistic number for the SEC. And I think those chances increased after last weekend uh, because losses by Kansas State, Iowa State, Clemson, three playoff contenders in other leagues. I think all of those really helps the SEC. And now I'm wondering, could we even get five teams back into the discussion? discussion or, or do you still see it maybe capped at four? Blake, I thought five would get in in preseason, but that was given the Big Ten only three teams. I think the Big Ten will get four now. I still think the SEC is going to be limited to four. Uh, Greg Sankey might uh, still lobby for six or seven, but <laughs> but, I, but I say four. Uh, one of the things that's really hurt the SEC, Blake, is these uh, – these non-playoff teams have come up with some huge wins. I mean, Kentucky is infirm as it looks right now. Its defense was good in the early in the year. It uh, almost beat Georgia, and it beat Ole Miss. What a bad loss for Ole Miss. Ole Miss could be sitting really pretty right now. And then Ole Miss goes out and really outplays LSU but loses a game. Uh, so we've had games like that. We've had Vanderbilt, of course beating Alabama. What if Alabama hadn't stumbled against Vanderbilt? How well off it could be. If not for some of those games, then we go back even further. LSU losing to Southern Cal in the opener. We thought that was a good loss if losses can be good. Uh, How did we know that Southern Cal would collapse? Uh, So really, uh, if those games would have just gone according to chalk, the SEC would have five in, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I agree with you, John. I, th- I think the most likely outcome is four from the SEC, four from the Big Ten. It's a little clearer, I think, who the four would be from the Big Ten. I mean, the, the, the four in the driver's seat right now would be Oregon, Ohio State, Penn State, and Indiana, whereas in the SEC, uh, I still count six playoff contenders. I mean, Missouri can get to seven and or it can get to 10 and two, but I, I count. Missouri is being out, even if they get to 10 and two, they were blown out by Texas A&M. They were blown out by Alabama. So they're out of the playoff conversation. So that leaves six contenders from the SEC. Now that number will be dialed back to five uh, based on the outcome of Alabama LSU. The loser, as I mentioned, is is probably going to be uh, eliminated from the playoff picture with three losses. And then the question becomes what happens with Ole Miss? If Ole Miss beats Georgia on Saturday. That game's in Oxford. Uh, the betting line is is pretty tight. Georgia did not look good against Florida, escaped with with a victory, but we're, we're losing for, for much of that game. Um, so that game is, I, th- I think, a little bit in question, particularly because it's at Ole Miss. If Ole Miss win that game, they are right in the playoff mix. And and then you could could have a crowded bubble once again in the SEC. But where it might be clearing up a little bit, you know, a week ago, John, we were all high on Texas A&M. They'd just beaten LSU. Mike Elko was juggling his quarterback situation well. And then Texas A&M goes to South Carolina and gets clubbed 
on the road by a South Carolina team that, that really nobody has wanted to face this year. I mean, South Carolina very easily could have wins against LSU and Alabama. I mean, they're five and three as it is, and they are, are so close to having wins against, against those two teams. And that, that would have put them in the playoff race, but even on the outside of the playoff race, South Carolina is still a team that can spoil your playoff hopes. And Texas A&M star running back Le'Veon Moss suffered a season ending injury in that game. So it was really salt in the wound of the Aggies who are sitting on two losses, really can't avoid another one. I, I'm starting to kind of reshape the playoff outlook, John, a, a week ago. I think my four playoff teams from the SEC were Georgia, Tennessee, and the two Texas schools. And now I have A&M on the outside looking in. Uh, if, if Ole Miss loses to, to Georgia, I think it'll be Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, and the winner of Alabama, LSU. If Ole Miss beats Georgia then I think that pushes a team like Tennessee or the winner of the LSU-Alabama game uh, on, squarely onto the bubble because it could be five teams left for four spots. Yeah, it, but if this season goes the way it has gone, if it, if it continues in that trend, uh, games that we don't think uh, teams will lose, they will lose. Uh, right. I, I just can see that happening. I could see, uh, for example, Ole Miss winning this week, then turn around and lose to Florida. Uh, that I mean, that's that's just the way the season is gone. Uh, I uh, and we don't know how LSU might fare against uh, against Florida. So it's really tricky. I uh, who is it? I guess. Uh, Texas, I mean, it's still got Arkansas. A&M, uh, who knows? A&M might go down to Auburn in a couple of weeks and lose. Uh, I thought that was a really significant loss for A&M, uh, not just to uh, South Carolina, but losing Le'Veon Moss. He's kind of the stalwart of their offense. He's a, he's a tough running back who can make the difficult yards, and they've been leaning on the run. I thought that was a big loss, and that makes them vulnerable. I agree with you. I like uh, – right now, I think Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, and LSU. Um, certainly the LSU-Alabama winner, but I like LSU a little bit more than Alabama. So, And, and I think Texas will beat A&M now. John, let's take a look at this Ole Miss-Georgia game because it, I think it got a lot more interesting after the way Georgia played against Florida – and, you know, an injury to Florida quarterback DJ Lagway uh, contributed, I think, to the outcome of that game. Although I think Florida would have found a way to lose anyway. It has sort of uh, earned a master's degree in snatching defeat yeah. out of the jaws of victory in the Billy Napier era. So even if Lagway didn't get hurt, I, I don't really have much confidence that Florida would have hung on to the victory in that one. But it did influence, I think, the, the final score. Um, and in that game, Carson Beck threw three interceptions. He now has 11 interceptions in his last five games. And, you know, if there's a concern about Georgia, well, I, I think it's probably not limited to just one concern. Uh, Georgia's been fairly Jekyll and Hyde throughout the course of the season. When they look good, they've looked really good. They looked great in the season opener against Clemson. They looked great throughout most of their victory in Austin, Texas, and handing the Longhorns their only loss. But they've been really shaky at other junctures of this season. Of course, they lost to Alabama. Um, they had all they could handle uh, from Kentucky. And, and really, they had about as much as they would want to handle from Florida. What do you think about the quarterback situation at, at Georgia, John? Because I, I know, yeah, Carson Beck's lost his security blanket and Brock Bowers. And I think at different points of the season, there's been some criticism directed toward the wide receivers, maybe toward the offensive line. But on a couple of those interceptions against Florida, those were just really bad decisions. By Carson Beck that really you can't put the blame on anyone other than Carson Beck, a veteran quarterback who should not be throwing into triple coverage late over the middle of the field like he did on, on one of his interceptions against Florida. And, um, you know, I, I think when a, when a coach doesn't change quarterbacks, there's, there's sort of two camps. There's the one camp that thinks, why aren't you making a, a quarterback change and putting in the backup 
who in this case is, is Gunnar Stockton. There, there's a few other quarterbacks in that program, of course, Jaden Rashada and, and others, but Gunnar Stockton has, has been the backup who was a former blue chip recruit. And, you know, I think there, there's that one camp and then there's the other camp of, well, if we haven't seen more of Gunnar Stockton yet, that must be Carson Beck's the best option Georgia has, but I'm not sure Kirby has gained that trust for us to just automatically assume that he's playing the best quarterback. If you go back to 2021, Kirby wasn't playing the best quarterback. And if not for multiple injuries to JT Daniels, you wonder what would have happened that season. It took two injuries to JT Daniels before Kirby handed the reins permanently to Stetson Bennett. And we know the rest is history. Bennett led back to back national championship seasons. Uh, and then you go back earlier in uh, Kirby's tenure and he was playing Jake Fromm while Justin Fields was on the bench. And so I do kind of wonder like, what would it look like if we saw a little bit more of Gunnar Stockton? I don't think we're going to, I think Kirby's going to keep rolling with Carson Beck, but boy, the way Beck's been playing lately, it, it does make me wonder about these other options behind him. Blake, I really think George is about to, it could very easily play its way out of the playoffs. And a lot of that has to do with Carson Beck. Uh, that's a nice history lesson in Georgia quarterbacking via Kirby Smart. Uh, I think I might be really tempted if I were in Kirby Smart's shoes, but I'm not. I don't make as much money. Um, not I quite. Would probably, I would probably start Gunnar Stockton in this game. Uh I, I'm really down on Carson Beck. His body language, I mean, he looks like he looked like a defeated man even early in that game against Florida. You you're right to point out the handicaps. Georgia doesn't have playmakers at wide receiver. It just doesn't. And of course, it doesn't have Brock Bowers, the elite tight end that saved its bacon so many times last year. So it's left to Carson Beck to kind of manage. And he's not managing well. No. So I go back to what happened with uh, with Texas A&M early in the year when it uh, against LSU a couple of weeks ago, rather, not really early in the year, but a couple of weeks ago when Mike Elko took Connor Wigman out and put in Marcel Reed and ran the ball. Well, I think that's what Georgia might need to do against Ole Miss put in Gunnar Stockton, who is a runner, and maybe get his running game going a little bit better than it has this year. Frazier ran okay against Florida. Uh, I just don't like the way this is unfolding. I think right now Ole Miss is a better team. So I, I think it was really significant. You pointed out, you go back to Stetson Bennett. Remember, Georgia didn't want Stetson Bennett to be the quarterback. Uh, mm -hmm. He was too much of a freelancer, okay? And, and and so Kirby wanted he wanted JT Daniels to be in there and follow the game plan and make the throws and so forth. Um, and Stetson Bennett won two national titles. I'm not saying Gunnar Stockton's capable of doing that, but maybe he could boost this offense right now. I think George is in big trouble this Saturday. Wow. OK. And if they are in big trouble, John, what does that mean for Lane Kiffin? I mean, Kiffin has done a fantastic job throughout his Ole Miss tenure of winning most of the games he's supposed to win. Now, there's a couple exceptions that, that we could reference reference. But for the most part, he has positioned Ole Miss to be on the right side uh, of, of a lot of these games against sort of the, the middle of the pack, the lower of the pack. SEC teams, um, but in the big moments, particularly against Alabama and then last year at Georgia, and then it's happened a couple times against Brian Kelly and LSU, um, Ole Miss has, has fizzled. And here comes another big moment, and, and it would be redemption for Ole Miss if, you know, if they could get this one and sort of offset that loss from September to Kentucky. But, you know, just with the history and in mind of, of Kiffin's last, you know, past performances in these big moments, whether it be against Nick Saban or LSU or last year's game against Georgia. I, I agree with you. I think Ole Miss right now is playing really well. They had their best performance of the season last week against Arkansas. And yet I just can't shake that, that history from mine. I feel like Lane kind of crawls inside his own head a little bit too much in these big games and, and Ole Miss just melts down. And, and doesn't 
doesn't win the big one. Now, interestingly, if Ole Miss would have followed the narrative of Lane's past seasons, they would have beat Kentucky, a team that they're supposed to beat, especially where Lane has built this program. That was a game that Ole Miss is supposed to win. If they would have followed the script and won the games they're supposed to win, it wouldn't be so paramount that they that they have to beat Georgia on Saturday. But now it is. This is a, an an elimination game, to be sure. Ole Miss is not getting into the playoff with three losses. So how do you handicap this with the way we've seen Georgia playing? Uh, you know, last week against Florida, Ole Miss looked great, but also knowing the history of Lane Kiffin crumbling in, in his biggest games. Yeah, I, I always remember when it comes to big games, uh, what Bobby Bowden said many years ago when he was, uh, he was, uh, you know, had a, uh, a dynasty going at Florida State. He was. Uh, he said he like he played some really tough games for a lot of big games against some really good teams. He said the big game, that's the one you don't win. When you mm. say somebody can't win the big games, uh, yeah, those are the games you don't win. They forget about the big game, supposed big games that you do when you do win them. Uh, but it's a, it's a fair assessment of Kiffin. I think we look at it two ways, and I think we look at it kind of the same way because we know Ole Miss's history, and we know what Ole Miss was uh, before Lane Kiffin. Uh, yeah, and I think he's done – Hugh Freeze had some – he had some moments there, but Kiffin has done better. Um, I think the real key to this game to me for Ole Miss and for Lane Kiffin I think right now Lane Kiffin has maybe the best quarterback in college football, Jackson Dart. Uh, Dylan really, Gabriel and Cam Ward would like a word, John. <laughs> I know, and I was thinking about that last week. In fact, to out last weekend, I still had Cam Ward uh, ahead of uh, ahead of Jackson Dart. But when I start looking at those stats, the more I look at them and I look at Ole Miss's schedule. And I think if Ole Miss wins this game, I would have Jackson Dart ahead of uh, ahead of Cam Ward. He certainly got the stats. Uh, he needs a marquee win. Uh, however, I, I don't know against what is has the image of an elite defense. I don't know that Georgia's defense. I don't think it's as good as it's been, but it's still really good. So does Lane Kiffin say, "Well, I've got a good defense too." Georgia doesn't have a great offense. I'm going to rely on my defense, not make any mistakes in, on offense, and, and not shorten the field for Georgia's offense, and and win this game that way. I don't think that's the right approach this time. I think he needs to go out and challenge Georgia's defense with Jackson Dart. He's got really good receivers. Uh, and Dart's playing so well, and he's more mobile. And you've got the advantage at quarterback in this game. I would want to exploit that. I love Jackson Dart over Carson Beck right now. I didn't think that in preseason, but I do now, and I don't think it's even close. He can do things that Carson Beck either can't or is not doing right now. So I think that's what Lane Kiffin needs to do is come out, come out blazing. Be Lane Kiffin and let Jackson Dart be Jackson Dart. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not quite as bullish on Jackson Dart as you are. He has a history of of fading in these big games. His his track record in games against Alabama, uh, Georgia last year, LSU is not good. Um, he pads his stats against the weaker teams in the schedule, and I think recedes from the moment in the big games, but, but I, but I do agree with you that for Jackson Dart to really be inserted into the Heisman conversation, he has to win this game. Ole Miss has to win this game because we, we know the Heisman race can turn on a dime in November. It's almost like what happens in the first two months. Uh, I don't want to say it's irrelevant. I I always think of it like as a, as a golf tournament, you have to at least make the cut. You know, you got to be ahead of the cut line after the first two months of the season, um, but then it, it would be like if the golf tournament reset the scores going into the weekend round. That's kind of the way I look at the Heisman race. Like, did you make the cut through two months of the season and now the scores reset and whatever you do in the month of November in your conference championship game, fairly or unfairly, oftentimes determines the Heisman race. So, yeah, if Jackson Dart can go out and, and light up Georgia and, and deliver an upset, 
I do agree with that that part of what you're saying. He would he would be firmly in in the Heisman mix at this point. Whereas if Ole Miss loses this game, you know, I, I don't know that the SEC really has a serious contender at, at that point. I, I agree, um, and I'm aware of Jackson's darts history. However, I think he's a quarterback who has kept getting better. And I think he's got his best receiving cast around him now. Uh, I mean, he lit up Arkansas to play without play, with despite Trey Harris not mm-hmm. not being uh, being there. So I maybe I'm maybe I'm too bullish on him. But just when I was watching, I watched those games last week and watching Georgia and looking at Carson Beck, and I'm thinking. I don't care what the history is for either one of those. For, for right now, there's no question I'd rather have Jackson Dart, quarterback in my team, than uh, than, I, than I would Carson Beck. And I think Kirby Smart would agree with that. <laughs> and so uh, I'll, I'll stick with that. But that's worth pointing out, Jackson Dart's history in this game. It's kind of like Lane Kiffin's history in this kind of game. So it's up to them to change the narrative and we'll see if they can do that. I kind of think they can. One of the narratives surrounding Ole Miss this season, John, I mean, it really stems back to early September, almost really, maybe even the preseason is the idea of Lane Kiffin to Florida. Now, Billy Napier still trudges on at at Florida, but I, I think the idea of Billy Napier saving his job gets less and less plausible with, with each loss that mounts. And now DJ Lagway is hurt. He will not play in Florida's game at Texas this weekend. So it's just getting harder and harder to see an avenue for Billy Napier to keep his job. And, and for a lot of Florida fans, Lane Kiffin has topped the wish list if, and when Billy Napier is fired. And we've talked about that before, just sort of in profile, Lane fits the Florida job, his personality, his offensive mindset. I mean, it really meshes, I think, with what the Gator fan base wants. And yet he's got a pretty good thing going in Ole Miss. He's very well compensated. Uh, I mean, Florida would probably have to back up the Brinks truck truck to really even have a chance uh, at Lane Kiffin. And that's after you stroke a uh, $26 million buyout check to, to Billy Napier. But it, it's interesting, John, because I, I think fans are still adjusting, and, and maybe we in the media are still adjusting, to how the coaching searches are going to go in this new world of the 12-team playoff. Because it used to be, like, as long as you weren't going after a coach in the four-team playoff, you could try to hire your your the coach you wanted and get it done by December 1st. Well, now, if Lane Kiffin wins this game and is coaching a playoff team— I don't think Lane Kiffin's walking away from a, an Ole Miss playoff team, regardless of whether he wants the Florida job. And I don't know whether he does or he doesn't, but I really don't think Lane Kiffin's walking away from a playoff team. So it's, it's like this threading of the needle. You have to be just good enough to be appealing to other jobs, but you can't be so good that you're in the playoff, which means, you know, Florida couldn't go after you until like at least like Christmas. And that would be after the transfer portal window, after the early signing period. I mean, you could really sabotage your roster by having a coaching vac- vacancy throughout almost the entire month of December. So, I mean, how do you look at Lane in terms of the Florida job? Um, like, do you think he looks better or worse to Florida by winning this game? I mean, I know he, his resume looks better, but he almost becomes a little bit more unattainable by by winning <laughs> winning this game. So if you're a Florida fan and you want Lane, what are you rooting for at this point? Well, it, if Florida really wants Lane Kiffin, then he's worth waiting for. I would be willing to risk that if I'm Florida. Lane Kiffin, as you said, does fit the Florida model. He's uh, high profile on social media. He stirs things up. He's got that Steve Spurrier quality about him. And like Spurrier in Urban Meyer, Big on offense, exciting football. He's recruited well. He's done great in the portal, and that now means something. Uh, So to me, if you want Lane Kiffin, don't worry about that. But don't expect him to hire hire him him away from Ole Miss when Ole Miss is making a run for the playoff. 
if I'm the Florida AD, Scott Strickland, and I think I can get Lane Kiffin, I'll say, okay, we'll wait for him. We'll wait for him. Mm. And if he wins Let the everybody national just team, wander off the roster, uh, kind of sabotage year one, and say we'll, we'll be punching – punching where we need to punch in uh, 2026 year one we might just have to eat it a little bit and and come what may well here's the thing how good is florida going to be anyway next year and um also kiffin's track record in uh, the transfer portal he hasn't just got it done a good job of getting guys he's good, done a really good job of evaluating players so i would have confidence that he could bolster the roster later, I would rely on that. But if I think he's the guy, Florida's made too many mistakes in the hiring business, way too many. If it thinks Lane Kiffin is the guy, then it needs to stick with him no matter how long it takes. Uh, As for Lane Kiffin, uh, no way he should. And I'm not even sure he wants to go to Florida. If I had to bet, I'd say, yeah, he probably does. But I can't imagine Lane Kiffin. He's not leaving a playoff team. He could win the national championship and go back to his history, Blake. He he left Tennessee after one year, won seven games there. The program was was surging forward. Well, maybe not surging. It was moving forward. And he takes his dream job, Southern California. I guess when Lane Kiffin made that move, and on paper it was the right move, I'm sure he thought he was about to win multiple, not just one national title, but multiple national titles at Southern Cal. Look at the history. He was there. He knows what it's like there, and he knows how he can recruit, and he knows how he can manage an offense. But it didn't work out. It turned out to be a disaster. NCA probation, scholarship limitations affected that, but it really went south. So he can't assume going forward – that he's going to go to Florida and win a national championship or two. Who knows Mm -hmm. how it'll work out. But right now, if he's got a chance to win one at Ole Miss, he certainly can't walk away from that. Yeah, he, he's not wandering off that roster while while or off that program while uh, Ole Miss has a shot at the national championship. I don't know that he'd take the job either way. I, I like a few years ago. Yeah, I think he would have crawled to Florida. Now. He's got a good thing going. He's got a strong, strong NIL program behind him at Ole Miss. I, I think it's a lot murkier as to whether Lane would would take that job. But he's definitely not leaving a, a chance to win a national championship. But if he loses Saturday, they're out of the mix for a national championship. And and then I think it gets kind of interesting, especially if Ole Miss were to go into the swamp later in November and uh, lay a whooping on uh, on on Florida. Then all of a sudden he looks a little attract more attractive again, even if he does finish nine and three and misses the playoffs. I want to get to LSU, uh, Alabama here in a moment, John, but um, as as we wrap up thoughts on what we think is, is going to be an upcoming coaching search at, at Florida. um, If I handed you a check for say $10 million and I said uh, that either Lane Kiffin or Kurt Signetti, who's just tearing it up with the undefeated Indiana Hoosiers in his first season there, uh, after doing a really nice job at James Madison, winning at lower levels. I mean, Signetti is one of the hottest names in college football right now. And I say, you can get either of these guys for, for $10 million a year. Money's not a problem. These one of these, these guys would say yes to a contract that pays $10 million annually. You could have either one. Who would you take, John? For If, if you could get both, get either at Florida, would you take Kiffin or would you take Signetti? That's a really hard question, which is probably not the answer you were seeking. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I don't know about Kirk Sinetti. I think he's done an incredible job at Indiana, and I'm really a proponent of guys who have won wherever they've been. He's just kind of late to the party. Lane Kiffin has has a bigger reputation. He's a bigger name. But, man, I love watching that Indiana team. They're playing like gangbusters. And it's not as though he's just come in there with some uh, fancy offense, pouring pouring on the points, uh, big quarterback and all that kind of throwing the ball. It's a complete team. Indiana's playing really aggressive defense. 
I wonder where they got these guys. How did Indiana get these guys that are playing so well? Some a foreign country or something? Some third world <laughs> nation? They came over on a boat and all of a sudden they're in Indiana starring. I I I think it's one of the biggest stories of college football season, one of the biggest stories of the last few years, in fact. So that would be a really hard choice. The thing is, I don't know anything about Kurt Signetti's personality, but I think he's kind of confident. He's got a little bit of bravado. Because as we've talked about before, that that introductory presser at at Indiana where he was, yeah, he's facing (laughs) those questions about, you know, how are you going to sell this program? How are you going to sell your vision? And you could tell he was just worn down by these questions. And he just says, I win. Google me. Um, it's like he, he put a, he put an end to that line of conversation, like pull up my Wikipedia resume folks and look at my record and, and then, and then come back with these questions. And he, he's been phenomenal throughout his career. He's, he's 20 and one in the last two seasons. He won one game. He lost one game last year at James Madison. Otherwise, uh, hasn't suffered a loss in the last couple of years. And, and he won at James Madison for five straight years, um, and, and lower level programs, before that, I, I'd be tempted to go with Signetti, John. I, I, I don't. I don't think either one of those would be a bad choice. If you could get Kiffin or Signetti uh, in your Florida, boy, you, I mean, you, you've won the coaching well carousel. I mean, either either one of those guys, I think, would be a really good hire for Florida. If I could have either, I might be tempted to go with Signetti because I don't think we've seen the ceiling for him yet, and I don't know if we've seen the ceiling for Lane Kiffin either. But he's been at places. Uh, like a Florida before. I know there were some circumstances around his, his Southern Cal tenure, et cetera, um, but he's been in this in the game longer. He's younger than Signetti, but he's been at this level longer, whereas I, I really feel like we haven't learned what Signetti's ceiling is yet. And so based on that potential for upside, I, I, I don't think there's a, there's a bad outcome if you could have either, but I, I think I might lean Signetti. If I had to make a choice, I probably would take Signetti too. One of the reasons being, Based on his comments and based on his track record, I think he kind of coaches with an edge. And I think there's a show me, uh, I want to show you approach to him. Uh, And that goes back. And I remember that's how it was with Steve Spurrier. When Steve Spurrier was hired at Florida, he was not considered a slam dunk. People questioned his recruiting skills. They questioned his overall coaching, his ability to build a program not just an offense. Everybody knew he could call plays. That was never in question. Uh, but there was kind of the, the – he had that image of, yeah, he'd rather be on the golf course than out recruiting. Fair or not. He recruited great at Florida. But I think Signetti has something to prove because he's kind of been out there in no man's land. I mean, James Madison and he, Indiana. I, I mean, <laughs> this is not a high-profile football program. It's a basketball school. Uh so here we go. I, I just, I think I would be really tempted to go with Signetti and the advantage of getting another advantage to Signetti. You gave me a check for $10 million to spend. That's that's very generous of you. You wouldn't need $10 million to get Signetti. Mm-hmm. He, he would come for less. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, all right, John, let's get to Alabama, LSU. Uh, we'll get to the picks later, but... Uh, Alabama is is the betting favorite in this one. It's interesting because games in Baton Rouge, um, as we record this, there's a tropical storm headed for Louisiana at the moment. So uh, we'll see how that shakes out throughout the course of of the week. But um, big picture, John, th- th- this would be a huge victory for either of these coaches. I mean, you know, Alabama suffers the embarrassment of losing to Vanderbilt earlier this season. Well, now all of a sudden Vanderbilt looks like a, a pretty solid team, a top 25 team. That loss, uh, while still embarrassing because of the name on the jersey, doesn't look quite so horrible uh, for Kalen DeBoer's first season. And he does have that win against Georgia on his resume, but their backs are against the wall with with two losses yet in the, uh, the Tennessee loss to the Vanderbilt loss. But I, I think this would be kind of a, a, a saving moment for Kalen DeBoer's Um, first season because the finishing stretch for Alabama is Mercer, Oklahoma, and Auburn. And I know we say, well, the Iron Bowl, you never know what's going to happen, et cetera, but Auburn stinks. Um, And and I think if if a trip to the playoff was on the line for Alabama in that game in Tuscaloosa, 
I think Alabama would be fine. So to me, this is the game Alabama has to win. And then I think they're in the playoff if they win this game. Uh, conversely, Brian Kelly in year three, this is what he was brought here to do. He was brought here to make the playoffs, to contend for national championship games. Now, he didn't get to the playoffs in first two seasons, but he won 20 games. And there was a feeling that things were moving in a positive direction. Well, now he's got the loss to USC. He lost at Texas A&M. They've played a really tough schedule. They beat Ole Miss. Uh, and there's still an opportunity to get to the playoff, but they have to beat Alabama. So in this moment, who do you think this game is more important to? Kalen DeBoer saving Alabama's playoff hopes in his first season or Brian Kelly continuing the prospect of getting LSU to the playoff in his third season in Baton Rouge? I think it's more important to Brian Kelly simply because he's in his third season. I know Kalen DeBoer is taking heat from Alabama. You lose to Vanderbilt and you're the Alabama coach. Of course you're going to take heat. And then he lost to Tennessee too. But it's still his first season. And look at his contract. Alabama's not about to hire a new coach. Not go, Certainly not going to fire him. Same way. And I don't think LSU is going to fire Brian Kelly either. But I just no. think he's going to take – he, he's going to take more heat because they went into this season with high expectations and he's kind of, he's a 10 win guy right now. It, it's not as though he's done terribly at LSU. He's done okay, but you expected him to contend and win a national title. That's why he left Notre Dame. The defense has been a problem with LSU. It was a problem last year, not as much so this year, but still, you look at the second half against A&M, and, and also the way that game unfolded, there was a problem because LSU looked at though it had never seen a running quarterback. I think that hurt Kelly's credibility. And he had that a tough loss to Southern Cal early in the year. He's had opening losses. Uh, so I think there's a lot of – I think the fan pressure is going to be tremendous on him if he doesn't win this game, even though Alabama is a slight favorite. Um, so, yeah, he's going to feel some heat, but I'm sure he expects it. Yeah, it, the knee-jerk reaction if if LSU loses, John, I mean, we, we know this, we operate in this industry, is, is going to be, oh, Brian Kelly's on the hot seat, you know, three years at LSU, he hasn't produced a playoff team. Um and, and I get it. I, I get why fans especially would be frustrated, but Brian Kelly's not going to be on the hot seat if he loses this game. I mean, LSU's recruiting class is ranked number four nationally. Um, he had those 20 wins in his first two seasons. And, and maybe most important of all, I mean, LSU committed like $100 million to Brian Kelly um, for, for the mega contract that they used to pry him loose out of Notre Dame. Now, at some point, if Brian Kelly doesn't get to LSU to playoffs, um, you know, that buyout's going to be at a point where LSU uh, says, well, this was a failure and we're moving on from this. But it's not going to be at that point this season. It would ratchet up pressure on his year four, uh, year five to make the playoffs if he doesn't make it this year. But let's face it, at LSU, there's going to be pressure to make the playoffs every year. That comes with the territory of coaching LSU, it comes with the territory of, of coaching Alabama. So, yeah, th there's going to be a lot of noise surrounding whoever loses this game. And, and I think, particularly in LSU's case, if they lose this game, I think it is fair to call this a failed season. Year three of your, your Bollywood coach that you, you spent a fortune on, he should be making the playoff in year three, but should be making the playoff and making a coaching change are two different things. LSU's not making a coaching change, but um, yes, this, this season could go down as a failure if LSU doesn't make the playoff. Now, for Alabama... I think it's a little bit different. I, I think, um, you know, expecting playoffs in year one of Kalen DeBoer, you know, I'm not sure I expected that in late January, right after the hire or even early February, but Kalen DeBoer set the bar for himself when in the preseason I asked him directly if he thought it was fair to expect Alabama to make the playoff in his first season. And he said, yes, that is the expectation when you're coaching Alabama. So by his own admission, the expectation is, to make the playoff. And, and I think in, in many circles, it would go down as a failed first season if Alabama loses this game and doesn't make the playoff. But again, there's a difference between failing in a season and 
a coach being on the hot seat. And I think that would be sort of the, the difference in realities in, in this situation. Yeah. If you want a hot seat coach, go see Billy Napier. That's a right. hot seat coach. These guys aren't, aren't hot seat coaches. Uh, I, I think the expectations for both of these programs will always be to make a playoff. In a 12-team playoff, Alabama, LSU, look at their history. Look at the coaches who've been there, who've succeeded, and your expectations are going to be the same every year. Uh, I, I, You know, I look at LSU and, and both Alabama. One team we don't talk about much, uh, and their fans have playoff expectations too because – History of their program is Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Been a dreadful year for Oklahoma. And there's a coach to me that's headed for the hot seat. Oklahoma still has to play Alabama. Oklahoma still has to play LSU. I know it's been a bad year, but I just wonder if Oklahoma might have one upset in it that could that could really uh, put a crimp in this uh, SEC playoff uh, race. I think it's plausible. Yeah, I, I would almost say there's a better chance of, say, in Alabama's case, that game is in Norman, and then they finish with the Iron Bowl in Tuscaloosa. I mean, Auburn's been just so bad. I mean, they scored seven points in a loss to Vanderbilt last week. The offense is is an utter mess. I, I think there's a better chance Alabama would lose in Norman to Oklahoma than at home in the Iron Bowl against Auburn. Uh, I mean, both those teams are, are really bad, but because of the location of the game, um, yeah, I, I think there's there's bigger danger to, to Alabama and Oklahoma than than Auburn. Uh, before we get our, our pick to our picks, John, you mentioned Oklahoma and maybe a hot seat kind of in the on deck circle, at least for Brent Venables. I want to throw this one at you because I think it's been flying under the radar for really all season. And I think it might be picking up just a just a hint of steam um, for the longest time. It seemed like Mark Stoops had maybe the best job in America got paid a handsome salary to go out and, and win seven games for Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky's a mess this year. They're three and six. They're just one and six in the conference. They still got Texas on the schedule. They got Louisville on the schedule. Uh, Louisville top 25 team. I mean, th this could finish at four and eight for Kentucky. I don't think they'll lose to Murray State. They'll probably get win number four there. But they could finish at four and eight. Mark Stoops, as we know, was trying to get out of Dodge last year and get to Texas A&M before A&M fans and boosters woke up and said, Mark Stoops, why would we want that guy? Uh, not so fast, Ross Bjork. You're not hiring him. Um, and so what once seemed unthinkable, Kentucky firing Mark Stoops. Do we still think that's unthinkable? I'm not asking you if it's likely, but is it time to engage with the possibility that Mark Stoops could be heading towards some trouble at Kentucky? I agree with that. It's not unthinkable at all. I mean, you, things either get better or you get worse. Kentucky's getting worse. Uh, there's some other factors here. I thought Kentucky would be in trouble uh, when the SEC expanded. We talked about this before. Uh, that's one of those programs that kind of has, yes, it's, it's, it's succeeded to a degree, particularly when you look at its history. But part of that had to do with its scheduling, strategic scheduling, not a difficult non-conference schedule, and being in the SEC East. Well, it's out of the SEC East, and also you've added Oklahoma and Texas. That's going to mean more as uh, the deeper we go into the uh, this expanded FCC. I know Oklahoma's down this year, but it won't stay down. I think it's going to be harder for Kentucky to get where it's been under Mark Stoops. And Louisville is a factor, too. I watch Louisville. Louisville is a better team than Kentucky. And I know Stoops has won some of these games that we think he's going to lose that are going to hurt his resume, and he ends up winning them. But I don't like Kentucky's chances against Louisville. No, and I think it was a bad look for, for Stoops to be a, a foot and a half out the door on his way to College Station and then – has this epiphany, epiphany at like 1 a.m. Uh, and puts it on Twitter. Oh, no, I'm staying after all. Well, yeah, you're staying after <laughs> all. After uh, <laughs> every Texas A&M fan uh, within a 300-mile radius was shooting down that trial balloon uh, with all the firepower they could muster uh, and wanting nothing to do with Mark Stoops. And then, yeah, 
Stoops had this epiphany. Uh, no, I think I'll stay at Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Texas A&M no. told you you'll be staying at Kentucky. I, I think another factor might be Mark Stoops is a little bit prone to pr- uh, to whining. Mm-hmm. And he, he's done that about NIL. I don't know that Kentucky fans want to hear that because Kentucky put a baseball team in the College World Series. Yeah. It just hired Virginia Tech's women's basketball coach. Um, and he's had a good program at Virginia Tech. So that program is going to be on the upswing. So it's not just you're competing with Kentucky basketball, men's basketball. That's always been, well, Kentucky is really good in men's basketball. It's just average and everything else. Kentucky showing that it can win in other sports, I think. And I think that could work against Mark Stoops. Uh, I think next year he'll be playing pretty much the same schedule. It'll just be at different venues. Uh, I think he'd go into next season on the hot seat. And really, he should, considering the money he's making. I think so too, John. And the hot seat next year in the SEC, uh, oh. boy, you, you, <laughs> there's going to be a hot seat in every corner. Really, it'll be a couch, a sofa, not a. Not a <laughs> yeah, you're going to need one of those big old sectionals yeah. that take up the entire living room <laughs> to, to accommodate all the hot seats in the ex- SEC next year. All right, let's uh, let's make some picks, John. Um, we we did it again. We had another dual losing record. Our hot streak is over. We were both two and four. Last week, I finally lost my lock of the week. Uh, you needed your lock to get to two and four. We're above 500 still for the season against the spread. I am 31 and 26. I have a one game lead. You are 30 and 27. The spread, but that's getting a little close, particularly when you factor in the VIG. So uh, let's see if we can make some money for our listeners this week and start off with Florida, a 21 and a half point underdog at Texas. Um, If you're wondering why this line is so big, it's because Florida is down to their third string quarterback, Aiden Warner, after the injury to DJ Lagway. Of course, Graham Mertz was already hurt. So Florida on quarterback number three at Texas. Uh, I'll start us off, John. It seems like I pick Florida every week. Um, Worked out last week. I took the points and they did cover against Georgia. But I mean, this, this feels like a really, really big spread, but I can't do it uh, with, with, uh, with Florida down to its third string quarterback. I am taking Texas and giving the 21 and a half points. Blake, I am too. I, I think to me, Florida is, of course, disadvantaged with very limited at quarterback. Its defense has been playing much better. I think this is a really important game for t- Texas to show. Hey, don't judge us by that three-point win over Vanderbilt. Don't judge us by that uh, loss to Georgia. I mean, that's what Texas has done in its last two games. It's trending downward. That's not where you want to be when you're in the running for the playoff. I think this is a game where Texas can really come on strong and make a statement. At least it needs to. And I think Florida's kind of set up after a tough game with Georgia, losing another quarterback. And Texas had two weeks to get ready for this. I look for Texas to be at its best. And and so I think it will cover. That's a lot of points, but I think it will. Yeah, Texas needs to look good on the eye test for playoff seeding. Um, You know, if if they lose another game for playoff entry, even as a two loss team, they need to look good on the eye test because their strength of schedule is not as strong as others in the SEC. It's not horrible um, when you look at it through a national lens, but inside the SEC, Texas lags behind some of its playoff contending peers on strength of schedule. So it needs to dazzle on the eye test. And I think this is an opportunity to do it. Um, all right. I, I, the big, one of the big games that we've been talking about, uh, Georgia is a two and a half point road favorite at Ole Miss. John, you were setting us all up for an Ole Miss upset. So I'm giving you the chance here to take Ole Miss and two and a half points. Are you going to do it? Yeah, I expect Ole Miss to win this game outright. I really do. Uh, Again, I go back to the quarterback situation. There's just too big a gap between the quarterbacks right now. Uh, From what I saw, I've seen of Carson Beck and what I've seen of Jackson Dart. And I also think Ole Miss's defense isn't that far from Georgia's. It's not quite as good overall, but its front group is pretty strong. I think it can shut down Georgia's running game and pressure Carson Beck. 
So I don't know how – and Carson Beck can't do what Jackson Dart does. He can't create as much offense on his own. So that's why I really favor Ole Miss to not just cover but win the game. I agree with everything you said, John, and in principle, I should be picking Ole Miss to win this game. If you threw out the history books, if I wasn't allowed to know the history and I just showed up on this on, on this blue marble like uh, three months ago, I would be picking Ole Miss, but I didn't. Uh, I was already on the marble, and uh, and and I've seen Ole Miss's history in, in these big games, and so, yeah, I, I, I have to take Georgia and give the two and a half points. Uh, moving on, John, South Carolina a three and a half point road favorite at Vanderbilt. These teams have been really the, the two Cinderella stories in the conference. Neither one of them is going to be a playoff team, but South Carolina and Vanderbilt have now combined for 11 victories. If you would have asked us before the season, how many years it would take uh, for South Carolina and Vanderbilt to get to 11 victories, it, our answer definitely would have been in the plural. We've probably been in about two or three years, maybe, for those programs to, to team up for 11 victories. And here they are, um, you know, Vanderbilt at 6-3, and three, South Carolina at 5-3. and three, And South Carolina, in particular, has played a really tough schedule to this point. Give them a different schedule. South Carolina, I think, is in the playoff conversation. Yeah. Uh, Van, Van, I mean, truly, John, I, I think if they, they, I they were playing, if they were playing a softer schedule, I think they're in it. And, and Vanderbilt, my goodness, uh, you know, I mean, they have three close losses, Georgia state. Okay. That's ugly, but it was close. And then, uh, lost in overtime to Missouri lost by three points to Texas. Boy, Vanderbilt's <laughs> is dangerously close to the playoff conversation, but neither one is, but they're both enjoying good seasons. South Carolina, three and a half point favorite. I'm going to take Vanderbilt in the points. Um, I, I think Vanderbilt's still being un undervalued right now because of the name on the Jersey, uh, Diego Pavia. Hugh Freeze is going to be seeing that guy in his in his nightmares for years to come. Just continues to beat Hugh Freeze and and Auburn, one of the better stories in college football this year. So if you're giving Vanderbilt three and a half points at home, I'm going to pocket them and take the doors. Yeah, if one guy, if one player could get a coach fired, then Diego Pavia is the favorite uh, with Hugh Freeze beating uh, Hugh Freeze's team last year with New Mexico State by 21 points. I. I look at this game two ways. If I when I look at and I tend, I admittedly, I tend to be too logical in my picks <laughs> and not consider emotion enough. Because when I look at it emotionally, South Carolina is going to drop off after a big win at home against uh, against Texas A and M, and it's playing uh, in Vanderbilt Stadium where there's the crowd is yeah there'll probably be more South Carolina fans there but it's just a small crowd. It's a different kind of venue. I don't think teams get pumped up there. They just right. don't. It, they go in there and they see those uh, construction uh, cranes, uh, the small crowd, the lack of traffic, and it, they just don't get psyched. We saw that with Texas. We certainly saw it at Alabama. So that's a, that's a reason to pick Vanderbilt. Uh, the problem I have with Vanderbilt right now, though, I think Pavia is is getting – he's taking a beating every week, and I think it's going to show. Uh, and, and I also think last week uh, Cedric Alexander, Vanderbilt's lead rusher, was playing hurt. I look at Vanderbilt as one of those teams when it, when it loses a player, its depth becomes a significant negative factor. So – I really, I say all that, and I, I, I can just see Vanderbilt winning this game. But I, I'm going to stay. Well, I'll give the three and a half and take South Carolina. You're right about Pavia, John. He he just completed nine passes last week against Auburn. The the peak of the Pavia story, story was really that Alabama game. And he's had a nice season, but he's not done his best work in the last few weeks. And I, I kind of agree with you. I, I think he's he's taken a lot of hits. At this point, I don't know if he's the same quarterback he was, um, say, in September, early October. But I don't know. Vanderbilt just kind of seems to find a way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll go Vanderbilt. You'll go South Carolina. Um, how about uh, Alabama as a three-point favorite at LSU? Who are you taking there, John? 
I'm going with LSU. Um, Tiger Stadium at night, that's a big factor. But also, even though Gary Nussmar had an awful game throwing against Texas A&M, well, he had an awful half in his last outing. Inexplicable interceptions he threw. Alabama's forte is not its secondary. It's not its pass coverage. I think Nussmar will have time to throw against Alabama, and I think he'll capitalize on it. So I'm going with LSU and and taking those three points. I am too. I'm surprised to see this at three points. I I feel like particularly with the game at Tiger Stadium, I would have expected more of like a pick em, a one-point line type of situation. Nussmeyer is interesting. Like at halftime of the Texas A&M game, <laughs> I, that guy was a Heisman contender. And then after the game is like, oh, forget about Garrett Nussmeyer. Heisman? What are you talking about? He threw three interceptions yeah. and blew the game. <laughs> but uh, he, he's uh, still... He plays in halves. I mean, he had a bad half against Ole Miss first half, and then came came back and let a clutch game-winning drive. Yeah, when when he's right, uh, he's as good as there is in in the SEC. I mean, he's supremely talented. You add in a a really good wide receiving core. I mean, both these teams have weaknesses, and I think both these teams are positioned to exploit their opponent's weaknesses. Like uh, you mentioned, Alabama doesn't have that typical pass rush. We we kind of remember from you know some of the better years under Nick Saban. It doesn't have um, you know all those stud DBs that Saban, uh, when his dynasty was really humming, uh, ran through year after year. And so I think Nussmeyer can can have a day here. But also, we saw LSU last time they went up against a running quarterback and Marcel Reed. Oh my stars! It was horrible. Um, and now you have Jalen Milrow who's one of the best running quarterbacks in the country. Now, at least LSU should be prepared for it, whereas they look like they hadn't even considered the possibility of playing Marcel Reed against Texas A&M. They will have had two weeks to prepare for Jalen Miller. Um, preparation doesn't always shore up a weakness when when you just aren't good at that 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 two things. I mean, uh, you, you could give me uh, two weeks to learn to speak French, John, and I think by the end of that two weeks, I'd learn how to order a beer and find the restroom and not much else. You know, two, two weeks preparation doesn't always solve your problems. So I think Vous both teams... uh, Vous êtes uh, stray stupide. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you you yes. are the French speaker on, on this yeah, podcast. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I think both teams are uh, positioned to t- take advantage of the other's weaknesses, but in what feels like it should be like a pickup game, uh, three points is mighty appealing. I will take LSU and the three points. Uh, that leaves us with uh, Oklahoma at Missouri as our last SEC game that we will pick before we get to our lock of the week. Um, John, this one's sort of the battle for mediocrity, I feel like. I know Missouri's still got a um, you know a solid enough record just sitting with the two losses, but Missouri t- seems to me like a six and six, seven and five team masquerading uh, as a nine and three or 10 and two team based on their schedule. Um, and well, Oklahoma plays one of the toughest schedules in the country this year. And so they might wind up being about a five and seven team. Missouri is a one point favorite, um, at home. I, I feel pretty similarly about both these teams, John, like I said, they, they both feel like six and six type teams to me. Um, but this season when in doubt, I've, uh, gone with the home team. And so I will take Missouri, uh, they just need to cover the 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 one point, and so it's almost a pick up pick them game. I'll take the Tigers. Uh, you're going with the home team. I'm going with history. I, I just can't I can't shake those games. I remember when OU and Mizzou were in the uh, were in the Big Twelve or Big Eight, and a, there was a I guess this was in the I think it was the mid '80s. Uh, Oklahoma beat Missouri seventy seven to nothing. I. I just think some of those old ghosts might come back to haunt Missouri. I know it's – I don't care how bad Oklahoma's look. When Oklahoma runs out on that that field at uh, in Columbia, how confident will those Missouri fans be? I don't Ooh. think they'll be very confident. You're right, John. I, I covered uh, Missouri for four seasons, and people in Columbia still talked – uh, all those years later, still talked about that 77 to nothing <laughs> game. That, that one did not quickly fade <laughs> from, really? from the memories of, of Mizzou fans. This one used to be a trophy game, John. It used to be uh, the Tiger Sooner Peace Pipe uh, was, <laughs> was awarded back and forth. It disappeared some years ago. It was, it was awarded by one of those clandestine organizations. I, I don't remember 
uh, which one it, it it was. Oh, it was it, it, the, the mystical seven um, was was in charge of of awarding the peace pipe. Well, the the mis, the, the the peace pipe mysteriously disappeared. Um, I guess in the hands of the mystical seven. Uh, no one really seems to know what became of the peace pipe, but uh, uh, man, I would love for that to make a return. You know, uh, the peace pipe's a little bit more uh, widely embraced in, in, in culture nowadays. This, this might be a fine time for the return of the peace pipe, John. I wonder uh, how many times Missouri had wish it could have just made peace with Oklahoma <laughs> before the game and say, hey, let's not go out there. We do all these uh, military football comparisons, teams about to do battle, battle. Let's just uh, sit down together, smoke a peace pipe, and uh, call the whole thing off. There won't be yeah. any more 77 to nothing games. Yeah, that probably would have been a good idea before that one that was played uh, in, in, I believe, it was 1986 that uh, Tiger fans still cannot forget. All right, our locks of the week, John. I'm going to try to get off the mat here. Uh, lost my lock of the week last week for, I think, maybe the first time uh, all season. Well, I'm not worried about that because I got I have a winner in store this week, John, you, you tried to warn me off going from the group of five ranks earlier this season. And, uh, no, I stuck with it. I think that was my only group of five lock I had this season and I got it. Well, I am going back to the group of five ranks this week and I am taking Connecticut on the road to cover six and a half points at UAB. The UAB experiment with Trent Dilfer has gone, uh, miserably wrong and so I will give the six and a half points and say UConn with which uh, don't look now, John, the uh, the basketball school UConn is six and three chance to go seven and three at UAB. Uh, I'll give the points and take UConn uh, to cover six and a half. Yeah, I think Jim Barr is a really good coach. Mm -hmm. Maybe his overall record doesn't show that, but it's tough to win at UCLA and it's certainly tough to win at UConn. Uh, I think I've been really good on my uh, locks of the week this year. You have been. And so I'm hesitant to to do what I'm about to do. But sometimes I, I get caught up in ego and I want to vindicate myself. I want to prove myself right. If we go back to preseason, when you ridiculed me for saying Iowa could make the playoff. Heavy Deservedly so. Deservedly so. Yeah. I, I think so. and But I'm going to take Iowa and uh, give five and a half points to UCLA. I know the this game's a, on the West Coast. Yeah, this was a game I was looking at, John. I, I like this pick. Uh, oh, you did? I well, do. I, I hated your thanks. pick of Iowa to the playoff, but I like this pick as a lock of the week. Well, Iowa has become sneaky good offensively. Have you noticed? I have, yeah. This is very clandestine, like the Magnificent Seven or the Mysterious yeah. Seven, whatever that organization. I, this is the, the Mysterious Eleven that have showed up on <laughs> offense for, for Iowa, and they learned how to play some offense. I, I look, you know, the score will pop up on a Saturday on my screen. I'll think, wow, I was really moving the ball well. Where, where did those 40 points come from? <laughs> have a really good running back, and they're throwing the ball a little better. All right. I like that pick, John. Uh, we'll see if Iowa can – maybe the bubble will get so wild if Iowa can get their way back into the playoff conversation and vindicate that pick. I, I might take a few hits on the peace pipe to think that that's plausible. <laughs> All right, thanks for stopping by. Big weekend in the SEC. We'll be back to discuss uh, that and more playoff drama next week. Thanks for listening to this edition of SEC Football Unfiltered.